Many things have happened in the history of the world of great gore and terror. But nothing is going to compare, according to the Word of God, to what we're about to ex experience in Revelation, the sixth chapter. Revelation, sixth chapter, is a is a chapter of terror unimaginable. Terror unimaginable. Terror that mankind cannot even imagine how terrible it is. In the history of the world, we find a lot of, of blood and terror. We have a, a history of inhumanity toward humanity. It is said that the Japanese soldiers of World War II, that their lives were worth less than one feather in weight compared to the empire. Soldiers by the millions have been sent to war and they have died. Sometimes for just causes, sometimes for whims of a ruler. Men have given their lives by the score for causes in history. Bloodthirsty savages, armies were. Bloodthirsty savages that devoured one another. Blood flowed on the battlefields inches deep. Human lives were snuffed out as if they were nothing. World War I was called the war that would win all wars, would end all wars, because it was so gory. We still had a cavalry in World War I, and they had mules and horses, and among the mules and horses, battlefields were just strewn with animal and human carcasses. There was one great invention in World War I that they used, actually two. Gas. Gas. People were exposed to mustard gas and they were killed. Whole battlefields of people died with mustard gas. They began to drop bombs from what we might call primitive aircraft. And one of the most horrid machines that had ever been devised was the machine gun. Rapid fire machine guns that could start from one horizon to the other horizon and just mow human life down and animal life. They were in trenches in trenches, living in trenches, dying in trenches. The smell of human and animal carcasses, the stench of it, was unbearable. Many men went crazy, lost their minds on the battlefields. People began to view human life as nothing. But you go back 4,000 years before that and the same things happened. They didn't have machine guns. They had arrows. They had molten lead that was poured out upon troops from walls. They dropped rocks on people. And people would besiege a city and the outside of that city was just paved with blood and human carcasses and animal carcasses again. 
How many young men, how many generations of men have been killed since the history of mankind, the time of Nimrod? How many people have died? How many lives have been shed and their blood spilled? And yet, the time that we're going to talk about now is a time beyond imagination, a terror beyond imagination. I remember back in the 60s and 70s they were saying, never another Masada, never another Masada. The Jews caused Masada. The Jews caused the whole destruction of Jerusalem. Masada was a Herod's fortress. High city on a hill, a mountain, a palace up there. The Sakari had, they were basically assassins, the Sarkari had daggers, they called them the dagger men. They were uh, what we might call uh, compounds of them in different parts of the, of the world at that time all the way from Cyrene in different parts of the Middle East and of course in Jerusalem. One of the, the biggest leaders, the largest, the most outspoken leaders was Severus that was supposed to be crucified with two of his soldiers. These were murderers. Yes, they would come into Jewish villages and and just lit literally take the whole village hostage and demand money to support their insurrection of the Roman Empire. And they would slip into uh, banquets where Romans were and they would take their little stilettos out from underneath their long coats and slip it in and stick it into the, but right at the bottom of the brisket and turn it in there, stab a Roman soldier and twist it and walk off and let him bleed out. That's why they call him dagger men. Jerusalem was brought down because of them. When Jesus was going to be crucified, Pontius Pilate said, surely I'll use this ace in the hole. I'm going to tell them, you want Jesus or Barabbas, and surely they don't want that rascal out turned loose on them again. But they said, give us Barabbas. And when they did, Jesus has said as he looked over Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, how many times I would have called you as a mother hen with her baby chickens, but you would not come. Not many days from now, not one stone will be left upon another. And that was because of the Sodom and the Sakar. The Sodom and Sakar. And they say never another Masada. Oh yes, we're going to read about it from now on. It's going to be greater than Masada. Worse than Masada I ever imagined. You know, millions of Jews were deported at this time because of what happened to Masada. The whole city was just leveled. It is said that they sowed salt so nothing would grow back. Sold salt on the ground, so nothing would go back. They wanted to stop the Jewish problem. Well, we still have it. But God, the last two messages that I, messages that I preached, one of them was called God's Economic Forecast. God has an economic structure all the way from eternity to eternity, and when we come right up here, where God called out Moses, he gave the nation of Israel the law. The law was supposed to read, lead them to Christ. But they became antichrist when he showed up. Jesus told them, he said, even though you reject me, I come in my Father's name, if someone else will come in his own name, you will receive him. Gladly welcome him. And I did a, a series of messages, the Jewish messiahs in history, that they did accept and they, that they followed. All false messiahs 
from the very not long after the death of Christ all the way back to the world today the, the false messiahs that they have fallen now let's read the sixth chapter or part of the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation I will be translating it to you from the Greek language so it may be a little rough sounding but I want you to get the gist of what's going on here and I saw, and that means that he literally saw something with his eyes. And I saw when, when uh, opened up the Lamb, one out of the seven seals. Now, we, the Lamb is the only one worthy of opening the, the sealed document. The sealed scroll. It is a scroll. It's not a book. It's not a book like this. It is a roll. And... Ever so often in this roll is a seal. You can open it up so far, and it has writing on the front and writing on the back of this scroll. It's a scroll. It's not a book, but a scroll. And every now and then comes the seal, and there are seven seals in the scroll. Now let's go look and see what happens here. And behold, when the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, by the way, Now this is the beginning of 14 action-packed chapters. Daniel 9, 26, and 27 brings us up to this also. Matter of fact, the whole Old Testament. One out of the seven seals, and I heard one out of the four living beings as with a sound of thunder. Now, the Jews are looking for a Messiah that will build them a temple in Jerusalem. They're going to find one. They're going to have one. Now, all of this takes place after the rapture. I know some people don't believe in the rapture. They don't believe in the millennium. They don't believe in any of the eschatology that we're talking about from the church age onward. They don't believe in the tribulation period. They don't believe in the millennial reign. They don't believe in eternity future as the Bible tells it. They lump all of this into one thing. And they think, many of them think that the, that the church replaces it, Israel. Israel is Israel and the church is the church. The church is the bride of Christ. All of those saved during the church age are in the family of God. Not everybody that is saved is in the church. Not everybody in the family of God is part of the church. I know that's a great mystery to many out there, but there's difference. We'll look at that. There are guests at the wedding. There are servants at the wedding. Who are these people? Who were the ten virgins that were friends of the bride? They're not the bride. Five of them got to go to heaven, got to go to the wedding feast, and five of them didn't get to go. And they were friends of the bride. Behold, uh, when the Lamb opened up one of the seven seals, I heard one out of the four living beings saying, with a thunderous, deep voice, and that word is brontes, brontes, a sound of a, like they call a brontosaurus in the, among the dinosaurs. Verse number two. Books have been written about this. This book here that I'm reading from was my doctor's thesis in 1980. It was a literal, grammatical, interlinear, and translation of the book of Revelation. With all the drawings of the seals and all of that. I'm standing in front of a chart that tells you the whole history of the human race and of the world. Of the angelic forces and spiritual forces from eternity to eternity. Many of you have written me emails to me asking me to teach on this chart. I just finished doing two classes, kind of a, a brief Reader's Digest 
synopsis of the From Eternity to Eternity called The Economic Forecast of God, or God's Economic Forecast. And we're looking at one little particular area of that right now. What God is doing here is He getting the Jews ready to serve Him again. We are in the church age, probably toward the end of the church age. I think the rapture could take place any time. Uh, that's what we call the imminent return, threatening to happen at any time. There are three ideas of the rapture, of those that believe in the rapture. And of course, some people do not believe in the rapture at all. I don't know how you can take the Bible and not believe in the rapture. we got two people that were raptured in the Bible, Enoch and Elijah, to tell us that it's possible. The tribulation period, after all the saved in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 are taken up into heaven, the book of Revelation from the 4th chapter on starts telling us about what had taken place in heaven. And now it jumps down back to the earth on Revelation the 6th chapter. And this is a time of terror, unimaginable. For seven years, Something's going to happen on this earth that's never happened before. We're not talking about the Syrian battlefield. We're not talking about the Civil War in America where hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives. We're not talking about World War I where we see the blood of war Unimaginable. They wanted to stop it. They started the United Nations, all of these things. The war that would bring the end to all wars, and yet we had World War II. We had Hitler. We had Mussolini. We had the Emperor of Japan. These were the opposing forces. We had Russia. We had Germany. We had a world at war. But nothing like what's going to happen here. During World War II and World War I, the, world, the oceans were poisoned. The weather of the earth was changed for a period of time. Anytime you have great catastrophes and great Pollution, you have weather pattern changes. And it happened. Mercury was lost in the ocean. And now you can go down and, and buy safe catch tuna. You need to do something if you eat a lot of tuna. They'll tell you how many, how little proportions, 0 0.134 parts per million of mercury in the tomb. One of the greatest catastrophes in the world when they spilled all of that mercury in the oceans. When the miners were using mercury to gather up the gold dust in their pans and then retort it and washing the retort out in the streams and going out into the ocean. They tried to catch as much mercury as they could because they used it that, that had the gold in it, the amount of it. The world's been poisoned by wars and by industry many times. But nothing compared to what's going to happen here. Nothing compared. Generations were lost. Many men in generations were lost to war. But we're going to find out that five every six Gentiles, five out of every six Gentiles in the world, five out of six are going to die. One, two, three, four, five out of six people are going to be killed during this period of time. The world has never known that. Two out of every three Jews will die, they're specified as that racial people. Two out of every three Jews are going to die. We're going to have one-sixth of the world left at the end of this period of time. 
and only one third of the Jewish population in the world. God's got a plan for the Jews. They're not worthy of it, but by the promise that God made to Abraham and to David, he will honor the Davidic and the Abrahamic covenant. And Israel will reign on this earth for 1,000 years. But how do you get a people so obstinate, so rebellious, to listen again? The rest of the story. And I saw, and behold, a horse, white. And the one sitting upon him having a bow, an archer's bow. And it was given to him a crown of Stephanos, a crown by right and by birth most of the time, by the right lineage, the Stephanos. The diadema crowned, what we call the diadem, the diadema crown was something that you won, a diadem. Alexander the Great had many, many crowns, or many streamers, many diadems from his crown that he inherited from his father, Philip of Macedon. His conquest with the diadems. Many kings have crowns put upon their heads by lineage but some by conquest. This one's going to be by lineage, I believe. And I'll tell you why later. And it was given to him a crown. And he went about conquering. In order that he might conquer. Ezekiel 38, 11, Daniel 7, 1 through 8. And 8, 25. So 9, 26, and 22. 11 and 21, Matthew 24, 4 and 5 and 6 and 7, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3, and Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. The man is going to receive a crown by inheritance. And then he's going to give him a bowl. He's going to give him the power to make war. He's on a white horse. And sometimes white is the flag of peace. White. Lucas. A white horse. Lucas Hippos. And when he opened up the seal the second, I heard the second living being saying, You come. Come. Verse number four, and he went out another horse, red, fiery red color, the sorrel. And the one setting upon him, it was given to him to receive peace, or take peace out of the earth in order that one another they shall slay. And it was given to him a great ability to kill with the sword. The seal judgments. The Antichrist shall take his throne on the religious and political platform of peace. And we will have the ability to put down all civil war among all the nations which have joined his confederation. Peace shall be taken from the earth and much blood will be shed as nations rebel against the Antichrist. And civil war continues within the confederations. A great famine will take place and a day's rations or food will be sold for a day's wages. One quarter of the population of the earth shall be killed by war. And shall be killed by famine and pestilence 
and disease which always follow every war. Let me tell you another thing. In history, many wars have been fought over religion. And this war is a religious, political war. Many who have, who were saved after the rapture, will now be martyred for their faith. But even more shall die. As Antichrist rules over the, the kingdoms given to him, he will have to put down all internal civil war, causing much bloodshed. To the result, okay, Please excuse that. Did not see the radio on. Back to the Antichrist. I guess the devil wanted this message not to go out <laughs> that far, but here it goes again anyway. As the Antichrist rules over ten kingdoms, he will have to put down all internal civil war, causing much bloodshed to the rebelling citizens of those countries and establishments. Many earthquakes shall take place. The sun will be darkened, the moon shall appear as blood, and many, and the moon and many stars and asteroids shall fall to the earth. You know, most people don't know this, but the earth, they say, gains a ton a day of falling matter from the skies. Asteroids and, and different types of, of uh, what we call space debris falling to the earth. But during this period of time, it's going to be tremendous meteor showers. It's going to be like raining rocks from heaven, from the skies. People will be so afraid that they shall try to die, or wish to die, and hide from the wrath of God to no avail. And many more are saved during this period of time, saved in believing in Christ. The nation of Israel will be numbered and sealed, and God reveals the future joy of those who shall die for him during the tribulation period, and there will be a silence in heaven for about a half hour. These are some of the things that going to happen. Where is all this business coming from? Why is all this happening? Jesus told his people, because you will not receive me, but will receive many coming in their own name, these great catastrophes will take place. Masada wasn't the last time the Jews died. The Jewish people have been cast throughout their world. They, they had no name, no land. They were a no people. And so, it is so uncanny that Paul says that you were once a no people. That you once had no economy in the, in the world of God. But now, you do. You are a people. And he says there is no difference between a Jew and a Gentile any longer. All are one. We're all lost people seeking the will of God. There was a man that came upon the earth. 
They say he was born in 570 A.D. He was born, Islam says, in Mecca. His father had died before he was born. His mother was very ill. When, they, when the rich people through the world, all the way rich women, the pharaohs, the princes, all the way down to time in different nations, when a woman, when a princess had a baby, they usually found a wet nurse for her, for the child. Now in Egypt, when they buried the, the pharaohs, they buried the wet nurses with them because they're very close to the wet nurse. What is a wet nurse? It is a nurse, a common person, that had a child that had plenty of milk, lactating woman, that they would give their child to this lactating woman, the woman that's producing milk, and that woman would breastfeed the child for them, for pay, etc. Now, when Muhammad was born, his father was dead, his family with the Quraysh that were ruling Mecca, if you believe in the history of this, many people doubt that Muhammad was even a real person, that he probably wasn't born in Mecca because Mecca was nothing at this period of time when they talked about being a great center, a trading center. But let's just look at it like he was a person, that he really lived there, okay? Let's just throw away physical, geological, and archaeological evidence and just believe the writings of Ibn Ishik and the life of the prophet, Muhammad, the life of Muhammad, the apostle of God. And let's look and see what they say about him. Now, I think the most accurate record, if there is a record of Muhammad, is the, the life of Muhammad by Ibn Ishik. He, was, he wrote this not too far from the time of Muhammad's life. He supposedly had some very good witnesses describing what happened. Now, Muhammad was born to this woman of ruling class. They say she was very poor, but what we call customs at the time was that if you were wealthy, you could hire a wet nurse to raise your child. You didn't have to put up with that. Many people, many historians outside of Islam believe that Muhammad's mother was very mentally ill and had epilepsy. And that Muhammad also inherited this mental illness and epilepsy. You can read about this in many sources. What he did. He was narcissistic. Narcissistic, that means you think you're better than anybody who's ever been born. That's from the, the Greek legend of Narciss that looked himself in the mirror or looked at himself in the pond until he starved to death, thinking that he was the most beautiful creature that had ever been built. Muhammad thought that of himself. He was born in 570, according to Ibn Ishik and many Islamic sources. He was let out. His mother hired a wet nurse and they took him out in Arabia. Now there are many reasons for why they believe this. Because there was an epidemic in Mecca at the time. Even though we don't have any historical record of Mecca even being like they said it was. Many people believe that Muhammad was born near um, what is known as Petra in the Palestine area. Mecca is in Arabia. 
Now, if their legends are true, and he was given out to this wet nurse, now, Ibn Ishaq tells us that Muhammad uh, had mental, some problems. And they wanted to give him back because he would go into seizures. Ibn Ishaq also tells us that the woman and man of this Bedouin tribe that Mama was raised in, this family, that they were very, they had very poor cattle and very poor sheep and goats. They were just, and their, their camels never, there's this skin and bones. But when she began to nurse Muhammad, that all of her sheep produced more wool and got fat, and they had more lambs, and uh, the goats had more kids, and her camels had more camels and had lots of milk. They drink a lot of camel milk over there, by the way. They have milk camels. Then everything just flourished. And, and all of the neighbor, everybody around them, they were still starving and everything, but this family is really this miracle of production. The woman was very thin and skinny and hardly had enough milk for her own child, but her breast sprouted lots of milk when she took on. Muhammad, and she could feed him and more. This is the story. Muhammad's uh, grandfather died, they took him, and then Muhammad's uncle took him. And Muhammad's uncle was a trader and a rich trader. See, his family were not poor. Even though Islamic sources say they were very, very poor, very poor, but they weren't. According to culture, they weren't poor. And he was let out. They finally brought him back when he was about five years old, supposedly. And, and his uh, grandfather first took him, and now his uncle takes him. His mother, in the meanwhile, they bring him back to his mother. And his mother goes on a journey, and she dies on the journey. And that's when the uncle takes him. And the uncle takes him under his arm and his wing and just, and he's under his uncle's protection because in the Middle East at that time, under the Arab culture, they killed each other all the time. They were slicing each other's throats and cutting each other's heads off. They were a murderous people. And it was just a horrible situation. Tribal wars were constant as it is over there today. They killed each other. Uh, Islamic world says that's the time of ignorance. But since Muhammad's enlightenment came, and the world over there changed. I don't know whether it changed or not. They're still slicing each other's throats today. Before Muhammad's law, Sharia law, there was law. We know that from the time of Abraham. The law of Kamarabi. Laban quoted that law when he told uh, uh, Jacob that, that he, had, he couldn't give him this, his second-born daughter before he gave the first-born daughter. All the marriages and everything else were according to this law, right and wrong, stealing and everything else was all in the, the law of Hammurabi. There was a law of Hammurabi also. So, the Middle East world wasn't without laws and lawlessness. They did believe in many gods, but when Muhammad came along, there was a whole lot of the Arabian culture that were converted to Christianity or Christendom. Many of them were Catholics at this time. Many were Orthodox and some Roman Catholics. If you look at church history, the chart over there, you'll find out when the Eastern and Western Catholic Church split. Now, when Muhammad was born, Catholicism had already sprouted the wings of conqueror by the sword and conversion by the sword. And they were doing that. They were heretics, the Gnostics, 
and they were people that were looked down upon, and those were the Baptists, the Paulicians, the Montanists, the Cathari, these type of people. They were believers in the Bible. They, they copied the Bible. They spread the Bible. And then there were the traditionalists that were under the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. See, Constantine came on long in 300. 25 and Christianized the world but the Christianizing of the world then was by the sword also if you didn't believe what he brought down in his councils you were considered a heretic and liable to execution or fines this is the history of the world when Muhammad was born okay Muhammad's a great he's a he's a great point in history in church history his life is very important. Whether you liked him, believed in him, or not, didn't believe him, it's a turning point in history. And we're going to find out is the greatest, it has the greatest effect upon the end times of any religion that's ever been in the world. The Catholic Church during the Dark Ages, up until the Dark Ages, killed between 50 and 100 million Christians. That's Catholicism. After what we call the Reformation, the Reformation clipped the wings of Catholicism to some extent. But I want you to understand what's going on out there besides the Reformation is the caliphate out of the Middle East. Let's go back and find out how all this started. Muhammad Finally, he tried to marry his cousin, and his uncle wouldn't give her give that girl to him in marriage because he was didn't think her, that he was worth anything, or he'd ever be worth anything or amount to much. The Islamic sources said he was a great trader, and his uncle introduced him to a woman, Kahid, Kahid. She was one of the most wealthy women in Mecca, according to Islamic culture. She was nearly 20 years older than him. And she already had children, and she was a widow. Now, for a widow to marry a younger man, that was very unusual. For, a, for an older man to marry young girls was normal. Even children had child marriage. A man might marry a woman seven or eight years old and consummate the marriage. And that happened many times. It's called pedophiles today or well, child molesting today. Well, Muhammad married this woman, Gaiju. She was wealthy. And he went on a trading trip for her before they married and, and she made a lot of money and then she, she proposed to him. He married her. Well, after he married this woman, he had a lot of leisure time. So he spent a lot of his time going and praying to what God we do not know, but he would pray. And there was one place that he supposedly prayed in a cave above Mecca. And uh, about 610 A.D. And something appeared to him from Muhammad's own words, he thought that it was a demon. You know, Islam is absolutely uh, what we call heavily populated with demons and bad spirits. They are very afraid to even spit on the ground, afraid they're going to offend something. Well, Muhammad went up in this cave and was praying. And this be it demon, he said, grabbed a hold of him and squeezed him. And said to him, recite. Now, according to many medical sources, they believe that he went into a seizure. And when you go into a seizure like this, you feel like you're suffocating. And anyway, this being 
this beast or demon appeared to him and then he recovered from that and then he appeared to him again and squeezed him again and told him to read and Mahomet said I can't read I'm illiterate I, I don't know how to read now some sources say that he did and even he himself said that he wrote and so to read you must be able to, to read you must be able to write also now <clears throat> A third time this being appeared to him and almost strangled him and he was felt like he was dying and wanted to die he was scared to death of this demon and he ran home after the demon he says the demon told him to recite why? We don't know, but he told him to recite. To recite something. Now, in Arabic culture, they are tremendous, prolific poets. Arabic is a very poetical language. And everybody was writing poetry. But the best poets were what they thought were demon-possessed. They were possessed by demon spirits and given the ability to recite and be a poet. Muhammad runs home. And he runs to his wife and said, cover me, cover me, cover me, cover me up. Hide me. Runs in the bedroom and she hides him. He's scared, he's cold, he's shivering. And he's sweating. Just as if someone had gone to an epileptic seizure. All of this is tied together. So he tells his wife, he said, I'm demon-possessed, I'm demon-possessed, I'm demon-possessed. I will be a poet, I will be a demon-possessed poet. And she says, well, why do you think that? Well, he told her what happened to him. And so she began to test the demons. And so she uncovered one leg, one thigh, and she said, do you still see him? And he said, yes. She uncovered her other thigh, and she said, do you still see him? He said, yes. He followed him home, evidently. Then she completely unclothed herself, and she said, now do you see him? And he said, no. Okay. Demons love to see naked women. But angels are ashamed to see a naked woman. Now, this is her interpretation. So she told him, Muhammad, you are now a prophet because the angel Gabriel has appeared to you. And you're a prophet. Well, this went on for a long time. He finally, he was going to commit suicide several times. He finally started receiving verses. A verse came down, supposedly. He divided his people in Mecca. They had 360 some odd gods. Every tribe had a different God. And in the Kaaba, if the Kaaba even existed, some people say it didn't. If the Kaaba existed, there were 360 gods, but they were all signatures of a tribe. This is my God, this is my God, this is my God, and we'll all come here and we'll all worship. And they sacrificed camels and lambs and goats and whatever there to appease their God. And in the Kaaba, they would all march around it seven times. This is pre-Muhammad. They march around that thing seven times, and then they touch the stone. This is the meteorite. And Muhammad later on said it was the hand of all that fell down. And the only way to be forgiven of your sins is to go on this pilgrimage and march around seven times and lay hands on this stone. And that way it will absorb all of your sins. Muhammad so caused civil disorder that his tribe finally was going to kill him. And he escaped down to Medina. And Medina was a Jewish settlement. 
And he asked them permission to settle there. And then he became a judge there, like Lot did in, in Sodom. He became a judge there, and uh, he finally got all his people out of Mecca, got them down to Medina, and then he became a warlord. As a prophet, he was never successful, but when he began to go out and raid caravans, and cut people's throat, and kidnap them, and, and uh, demand bounty, he paid his soldiers, his warriors, his religious warriors, all the booty that they could take, all the women that they could break, and all the slaves that they could capture would be theirs, except he got like 25% of it. And this went on for several years. He built a mosque in Medina, which was the first mosque, and he began to raid and raid and raid. Finally, by deceit, by a false covenant with the Meccans, he got access there and he went in finally. He wanted to go worship there, he said. If he had a new revelation for a only one, a monotheistic revelation, why did he ever want to go back there where all these gods were? There was only one god that he left in the in the Kaaba when he supposedly cleansed it, and that was a that was a Jesus and Mary. But Muhammad's idea of Jesus and Mary and our idea of Jesus and Mary are not the same per, pe people in history at all. By 623 A.D. when he died, they had conquered the whole Arabian Peninsula with the sword. Everybody was forced to either pay a tax to stay alive with protection money, or they became Islamic. And this is the beginning of the story in Revelation 6 chapter. Now all of this, the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ were always living down. They never declared war on anyone. The true churches did never declare war on anyone at this period of time. The warring factors with Catholicism and Islam. They were killing each other right and left. I can tell you one story after another how Muhammad would go into an area or his people and deceive the people and then conquer them. Deceit, Muhammad said, is war. Deceit is war. Lying is war. Deceit is war. God has always had one message. That's salvation by grace through the grace of the person of Jesus Christ and Him only. We're going to take up with this message further. This is only the beginning of the story. But it's a very important beginning of the story. The book of Revelation has a beast, a false prophet, and a Christ. Islam has a beast, a Mahdi, and a Jesus that we'll introduce to you two later. Previews of coming attractions. Our Heavenly Father, we send this message out for your honor, for your glory. And I pray, Father, that I uphold my Savior and tell him about the salvation that he so richly blessed the world with through his life and his blood and his resurrection. Father, forgive me where I fail you, I pray. And I pray that these series of messages will touch people's lives, hearts, enlighten them, and to let them know the truth and what's coming upon the world. In Jesus' name I pray.